as we read the Bible, with its accounts of historical events, with its uplifting poetry, with its instruction that teaches us how to live and how not to live, with its stories that encourage us and sometimes warn us of the consequences of our behavior, with its predictions of the future, it may appear that these things that are scattered throughout the Bible are somehow unrelated to each other. After all, the Bible was written over the course of about 2,000 years by 40 different writers in three different languages. It was written by a wide variety of men from different social and cultural and educational backgrounds. It was written by shepherds, by kings. It was written by fishermen, by prophets, and even by a priest. And it was written from a variety of places. It was written from palaces and prisons. It was written by those who were in exile, those who were in the wilderness. Yet, in all points, from beginning to end, there is perfect harmony. There is absolute consistency in its message. How do we explain that? The only way that we can explain it is that it was written by one author. That it was written by the God of the universe who directed those men what to write while not suppressing their emotions or their personalities. And that makes the Bible a book unlike any other book that has ever been written. The Bible is the written record of God. Of how he created a world, a universe. A people who would worship him, who would love him, would live in peace and in joy, but who chose to rebel against their creator and to reject his authority over them. Yet we find in the Bible, throughout its pages, that he, in his mercy, promised to send a Savior, promised to send one who would take the punishment that we deserve for our rebellion against him and to bring us back into a relationship with him, a relationship that would last forever. From beginning to the end, the Bible is the story of that Savior. And the Apostle John in the Gospel of John is quick to acknowledge in chapter 1, in chapter 3, throughout his entire gospel, that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of those promises that have been made throughout the pages of the Bible concerning that Savior. He is, John says, the true light who enlightens every man, who points the way to heaven. He is the one who alone can take away our sins, the sins of the world. The only one who can save us from the wrath of God because of our rebellion against him. And though Jesus first came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, his salvation is for all those who will come to him. A light to the nations, he said in Isaiah chapter 49, so that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. And to dramatically illustrate the plan of God to reach all people in this world, Jesus reaches out to a person who was rejected by those in her own society, an outcast, in a society of outcasts. A Samaritan woman living in sin. So Jesus traveled to that region of Samaria, about a half a mile from the village of Sychar. 
He came to a well where this woman had come on that day and at that time to draw water from that well. And though she had come there for water, Jesus had come there to give her the water of life, to show her her need of a Savior, to tell her that he knew all about her. He knew all about her sin. But he was the Messiah. He was the Christ of God. He was the Savior of the world. So in him, there is forgiveness for sin. In him, there is life. Life eternal. And at this point, in the conversation with this woman, it says in John chapter 4, verse 27, Api tutoi, in Greek. At that very moment, his disciples came back from buying food in the village of Sychar. They'd returned, and they had lunch for all of them. But when they had left, left Jesus by the well to go into town to buy groceries, he was alone. But when they returned, he wasn't alone. And they marveled, it says, Thaumatso. They were amazed, surprised. They were surprised that he had been speaking with a woman, especially a Samaritan woman, since the Jews and the Samaritans were bitter enemies. They didn't know who she was. They didn't know anything about her life. They didn't know that she had been married five times. They didn't know that the man that she was living with, she wasn't married to at all. All they knew was that a Jewish man, especially a rabbi, was not to speak to a woman in public. And so, they were speechless. They were amazed. But maybe we should be, maybe we should be amazed that, that Jesus would speak to us. That he would reach out to us and seek us. Knowing our sin. He knows all about us. Just like he knew about that woman. But he values each one of us just like he valued her. And he wants to bring us to himself. So he reached out to her. Just as he reaches out to us today. And the timing of the return of those disciples was God's timing, wasn't it? He determines the times for all things before they are written down, before they occur. And being at that well, at that time, allowed the disciples not only to see that woman, But it allowed them to hear the words that Jesus spoke to her when he said he was the long-awaited Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one of God, the one who had been sent from heaven. A declaration, a revelation to her, to them, and to us of his true identity. This is the first time in Scripture that he publicly declared that he was the Savior of the world. And though the disciples were puzzled by what they saw and what they heard, they were puzzled by what he did. Yet it says they kept quiet. They didn't question him. They didn't argue with him. They didn't second guess him. No one from among them said, What do you seek from her? Or, why do you speak with her? Maybe the lesson should have been clear to them. The gospel message cuts across all barriers. It cuts across all nations, all peoples. The gospel reaches to the ends of the earth. The Lord seeks to save the souls of men and women from every tribe and nation and tongue. So, 
The disciples arrived, and the woman left. But we're told she left her water pot behind. Athiemi in Greek. She abandoned it. Maybe it was so the disciples could draw water for themselves from the well. Maybe it was because carrying that large water pot on her head or on her shoulder would have slowed her down. Now she was on a mission, wasn't she? She had something to say. You know, when the Lord draws us to himself, and we know that we belong to him, it fills our heart, doesn't it? It's difficult not to want to tell someone of what has happened in our lives. This woman was spiritually thirsty. Now she wasn't thirsty anymore. Her new life had begun. She left her old life behind. Nothing's the same when we come to Jesus. Nothing is the same when we are in Christ. Jesus had caused her to face herself, to face her sin, and to face her Savior. She was now a new creation in Christ. Her sins, which were many, were forgiven. And so, we're told, she went back into the city of Sychar. Her city. The place where everyone knew her. Where everyone knew all about her. And all about her sin. And when she got there, we're told, she found the men of the city. And she said to those men, come. Jute. Follow me. And see, Horao. Determine for yourselves if what I say is true. I've met a man by the well. Someone who never met me before. Yet someone who told me all the things that I have done. He knew everything about me. Yes, everything. Come see for yourselves. You decide. But let me tell you this. He has wisdom. He has insight that can only come from God. This, this is not the Christ, is it? The one that we and our forefathers have been waiting for? The promised one spoken of by Moses? Her words were simple, weren't they? But they were honest. She spoke of what she knew. She spoke of what Jesus had done for her in her life. So the men went out of the city, it says, in verse 30. Exerkomai. They immediately, without delay, kept going out. There was a large crowd of them. A whole procession of men leaving the city. They were curious to find out. Could this be our Savior? And so they were coming out to him. They were on their way to Jesus. In the meanwhile, it says in verse 31, while they were making their way to Jesus, The disciples were requesting of him, Eratajo. They kept begging Jesus over and over again, saying, Rabbi, eat. Eat something. Eat some of the food that we've brought back for you. But just as the woman didn't understand when Jesus spoke to her of water, of spiritual water, of the water of life. In the same way, the disciples did not understand when he spoke to them of food, of spiritual food. And his response to them only confused them more. He said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. Better food. Spiritual food. So the disciples were therefore saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat. 
Did he? I mean, they had gone all the way to Sychar to bring back food, which was important. It was the right thing to do. It showed, showed their love and it showed their concern for Jesus. But as Moses said to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 3, and as Jesus said to Satan in Matthew 4, verse 4, man does not live by bread alone. Man lives by everything that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Physical food is necessary. It's necessary to live. And it's important, just as our other needs are important. But doing the will of God, obeying his word, that is real food. That is sustenance that takes priority over these things. Think about it. When the disciples arrived back at the well, they had just seen Jesus leading this woman to salvation. They had heard him declare that he was the Messiah. And all they were concerned about was serving lunch. So Jesus said to them, My food, the food that I hunger for, the priority of my life, what brings me the greatest joy and satisfaction to my soul is this. It is to do the will of him who sent me. To do what pleases him. I left the glory of heaven in order to glorify him. I delight to do thy will, he said to the Father in Psalm 40, verse 8. Thy law is within my heart. That was his spiritual food. That was the feast for his soul. The joy of obedience. Obedience to the will of God. The obedience to his Father in heaven. To bring the truth to this world. And the joy, the resolve, the single-mindedness to accomplish his work. Teleo. To finish the assignment. To finish the task. The task that lay before him. And what was that assignment? What was that task? Well, it was to die for us, wasn't it? It's the same word that he spoke from the cross. Tetelestai in Greek. It is finished. It is accomplished. It is paid in full. The debt has been canceled. We are free. That is what brought our Savior joy. The joy of our salvation. The joy of our deliverance. From our sin. Look around you. He said to his disciples. Look at the fields of grain. They're still green. Because they're not ripe yet. And so they're not ready. To be harvested. The tops of the grain. Are not white. And in looking at these fields. Do you not say. There are yet four months, and then comes the harvest in the spring? Well, of course you do. But behold, I say to you, look down the road, and lift up your eyes, and see those men from Sychar coming down the road in their lightly covered robes, and look on the fields of men. Look on their hearts. Their hearts have been prepared by God. And they are white. They are ready for the harvest. Ready to receive the message of salvation. So we must be faithful to bring the message of salvation to them today. 
Because as it says in Proverbs 27 and James chapter 4, tomorrow is promised to no one, to no man. The time's now. The priority of life is the work of the Lord wherever we may find ourselves and whatever he has for us to do. But for there to be a harvest, there must be sowers. There must be, there must be reapers. There must be workers in the field. And already Jesus said in verse 36, he who reaps is receiving wages. That is the joy of seeing a soul rescued from the flames of hell. That is our reward, isn't it? The work has already begun. And the Lord is gathering fruit. He is gathering the souls of men and women for life eternal. That he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together in unity of purpose as we submit ourselves to the task that the Lord has given to each one of us in the body of Christ. As we're told in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, though one plants and another waters, it's God who gives the growth. It's God who gives the increase. It's only God who can save a soul. We're just fellow workers. We're laborers together for him. For in this case, Jesus said, In this case of this village, the saying is true. One sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored. Men like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses. They were used by God to to touch the hearts of these people in Sychar, even that woman. The woman at the well was used by him. And you, you've entered into their labor. You will have the privilege of seeing these people come to salvation. So, from that city, we're told in verse 39, many, palus, a great number of the Samaritans, believed in him, pistul. They put their faith in Christ. They put their trust in him. They put their trust in him, it says, because of the word, the statement of that woman who testified, who faithfully spoke as a witness for him and pointed them to Christ. She told them how he, how Christ had affected her life. And she testified and said, he told me all the things that I have done. And she was never the same again. So when the Samaritans came to him, they were asking him to stay with with them. They wanted to know more. They wanted to understand. And so it says he stayed in that village for two days. And what was the result? Many more. An even greater number of them believed because of his word. Because of what he said, because of what he taught, because of who he is. Something happened in that village, didn't it? Something that did not happen in any other village or town, even in Judea or Samaria. This village was transformed. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For now, we have heard for ourselves. We've heard it for ourselves. It's great to hear the testimony of those who've been saved. But we need to come to Christ ourselves. Now, our hearts have been changed, they said. Now we know. 
Now we know for sure that this one called Jesus is indeed the Savior of the world. Amazing story, isn't it? From one woman at the well to the entire village, those who've come to Christ. Now we know, they said, he is not only the Savior of the world, he is our Savior. He's our Lord. But, as it was then, so the words of Matthew chapter 9 are true now. The harvest is indeed plentiful. But, the laborers are few. So we are told that we are to pray that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into his harvest. We are to pray that we might be those laborers, that we might be the answer to our own prayer, or how else can we explain to the Lord why we were not available to do his work? What will we say? Will we say we were just too busy? Too busy with other things? Or maybe we were too lazy? Or we were too selfish? Are we any less responsible to do his work than his disciples at Sychar? May the Lord cause us to look up. As he told his disciples to look up. May he cause us to see that the fields are not green. The fields are white. They're white with the soul of those who are perishing. And may we weep and may we mourn for them and reach out to them with the heart and with the love of our Savior. Amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Borean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.